Firstly, everyone, and uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, those who are living across the countries, and also those who are watching live from Kala Chakra Center's YouTube channel. <clears throat> and uh, before I uh, actually start the program, I would like to request that um, if anybody is listening from uh, the translation of English, and there's a uh, there's an interpretation below in a um, logo of the Earth logo. So you just have to press the English in the interpretation. Those who are a French listener, and please um, press the French, the French translation. And so that uh, during the interaction session that you could able to hear the English uh, questions and also the translation. And uh, and we will have the question answer session after Gishla's uh, teaching. So if anybody has a question, please keep that question at the end. And, uh, and this program, this teaching, which is a four day teaching on the Noble Mayana Sutra, the Rai Seedling Sutra, Salistamba uh, Sali Sutra in Sanskrit and Salujangbe Do in Tibetan uh, is organized in the collaboration with uh, Kala Chakra Center, uh, Paris, and Cosme and Virel, a center of Gendim Dupa, Ishinubu, Sopema nonprofit. So uh, we welcome you all. And now I would like to request uh, Ms. Manjari, uh, Manjari Ji to start the preliminary prayer. Thank you. Well, I'll be screen sharing. Tashi Delek, everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so we'll begin our practice by setting a proper motivation, which consists of three parts while being mindful of both aspects, the object being visualized and the manner in which we're visualizing it. Uh, the first is the refuge field in the space in front of us in envisioning Buddha Shakyamuni, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, and all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and any other enlightened beings which we regard with veneration. They're looking upon us with immense kindness and unconditional love, just as a mother looks upon her only child. The Bodhicitta field, visualizing on either side of us our kind parents, mother on the left and father on the right. Additionally, we're accompanied by all other dear mother sentient beings, leaving none aside, and we're leading them in this practice. The purpose of the practice is to manifest the Buddha nature within us, which is the ultimate source of happiness, by removing the two mental obscurations, afflictive obscurations, consisting of the afflictions of um, negative emotions, contaminated kadmas, and their corresponding active seeds, and the cognitive ob obscurations, the subtle stains, the inactive latencies of the afflictions and contaminated kadmas. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Padma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Sange Chodam Sogi Chomnam La, Jangju Bardo Dagi Kyapsuchi, Dagi Jinso Kipe Somnam Ki, Drola Penchi Sange Drupar Shok. Sange Chodam Sogi Chomnam La, Jangju Bardo Dagi Kyapsuchi, Dagi Jinso Kipe Somnam Ki, Drola Penchi Sange Drupar Shok. Sange Chodam Sogi Chomnam La, Jangju Bardo Dagi Kyapsuchi, Dagi Jinso Kipe Somnam Ki, Drola Penchi Sange Drupar Shok. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. 
I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulation of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Independent origination, there's no ceasing, no rising, no annihilation, no permanence, no coming, no going, no separateness and no sameness. I prostrate to the consummate Buddha, the supreme among all teachers, the one who taught this peace, which is freed of elaborations. I prostrate to the mothers of the hearers, the bodhisattvas and the Buddhas, who through the knowledge of all lead hearers seeking pacification to complete peace, who through the knowledge of paths cause those helpers, those helping migrators to achieve the aims of the world, and who through the possession of omniscience helps subduers expound a variety of teachings. The one who is transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher, sugata, and protector to you I make prostrations. The one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations and is endowed with the divine bodies of the vast and the profound, who eternally shines forth the forever noble light rays, to you the Buddha I make prostrations. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. The cessation of the causes as well is taught by the great seer. Profound, peaceful, elaboration-free, clear light and non-composite, such as the nectar-like dharma I have discovered. Finding no one who can fathom this teaching, in silence I will retire into the woods. Beyond utterance, thought and expression is the perfection of wisdom which is unborn, unceased, and has the nature of space. It is the object of apprehension of self-realized wisdom. To you, the mother of the Buddhas, the three times at Bay Basins. All composite things are impermanent. All contaminated things are of the nature of suffering. All phenomena of the nature of emptiness and selflessness. Transcending sorrow is peace. The Guru is the Buddha, the Guru is the Dharma, likewise the Guru is the Sangha. The Guru is the source of everything wholesome. I go for refuge in the Guru. By the sound of the vibrant drum of Dharma, you liberate all beings of miseries. I beseech you to kindly remain and give teachings until the end of the expanse of billions of eons.
The Buddha does not wash the negativities of beings, nor does he remove their miseries by his hands. His spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It is by teaching the truth of suchness that beings are liberated. With folded hands, I beseech the Buddhas of all directions to shine the light of dharma for all bewildered in misery's gloom. If you're attached to this life, you're not a spiritual practitioner. If you're attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you're attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhi Swahatiata Om Gate Gate Paragate Barasam gate bodhi swaha tiyata om gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi swaha tiyata Om Gati Gati Paragati Parasam Gati Bodhi Svahatyata Om Gati Gati Paragati Parasangate Bodhi Swahatyata Om Gati Gati Paragati Parasangate Bodhi Swahatyata Om Gati Gati Paragati Parasam Gati Bodhi Swaha oh, Thank you Manjari Ji. Now I would like to request Keshala to kindly proceed the session. <clears throat> okay um thank you manjari ji and thank you uh tinsumla uh tinsravenla and kamasajula um so as the earlier sessions, we will uh, take the Aspiration Bodhisattva vow. And um, as indicated by Manjariji, let us at the, so for all virtues, particularly more the, the, the virtues um, which we do collectively or more in the, the sitting posture, uh, we do that in conjunction with the refuge and the Bodhicitta. And for the refuge field, visualize Buddha Shakyamuni, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and all the Buddhist Bodhisattvas in the space in front of us as so loving, caring, and embracing.
And for the Buddhist of the field, let us visualize your two kind parents and all of them members, including children, and all of the dear mother sentient beings around you, leaving them aside. And particularly the places where uh, the nowadays is the the season of uh, the the monsoon season, but where the flood is um, the uh, frequent phenomena, let us pray that no damage happens, uh, particularly to the lives of people, to the lives of the animals, and so forth. Um, and the purpose of our being together here is to accomplish, is to learn how to accomplish our aspirations, aspirations for yourself and for all the demons and beings. Um, by in ways of attaining your the fearlessness and attaining infinite happiness fearlessness also referred to as the technically referred to as nirvana and infinite happiness technically referred to as buddhahood and uh, meanwhile that we should be convinced we should gain the conviction that these two things can be attained we have the that the two seeds the treasures within us in the form of Buddha natures. And the, the Buddha natures within us, like the gold, a very pure gold, but when mixed with the, when, when obscured by the mud, uh, the, though the nature of the gold is to glow, but it doesn't glow, it doesn't mean that gold is not there. Uh, the, the mud is the one which obscures. Likewise, we have the Buddha nature, incredibly great treasure of enlightenment, full awakening, but why it is not manifested because it is obscured by the mental defilements. So our job here is to learn how to remove these mental defilements. We don't really need to think of bringing the enlightenment from elsewhere to us. Um, the, as the Buddha Shakyamuni indicated, which is further explained by Acharya Nagabodhi, student of Arjuna, who taught that the enlightenment is not given to you or bestowed upon you by anyone else nor is the cause of the enlightenment being held by somebody for you. It is you through discovering your own Buddha nature that the enlightenment is attained. So this is a very powerful, I say, the message of hope for all of us. Um, the, however, the, the, I say, the demoralized we are, we think about this true nature within us, we'll be inspired and we'll feel respect to all others equally that we all have the same, same potential. So now how to do that is by resorting to a very powerful remedy to remove the mental defilements. And the mental defilements, technically, there are two kinds of afflictive obscurations and cognitive obscurations, gross and subtle. And the remedy lies in the wisdom of emptiness. This is the only remedy. And of course, there are ways, me, ways and means by which to remove the mental defilements superficially. That is known as suppressing, or just covering them up and not uprooting them. This is one way of removing the mental defilements, but it's not really safe. For example, like the, 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 two, the two teachers of the Buddha Shakyamuni, Acharya Alarakalam and Acharya Udrega, both of them have actually suppressed the defilements of the desire realm and they've taken birth in the formless realm. And yet uh, that the, they could not uproot the cause of the, the miseries altogether. So after being there in the form formless realm for, some, for a long time, they will again come back. They have to come back to the desire realm and take any kind of form. So therefore, the Buddha taught that the root must be uh, get rid of, and it, these defilements man, must be got rid of from the root. And for this, the wisdom of emptiness alone is a liberating path. We should not forget it. And, and the in this life, try best to gain conviction that finally no matter what so for example some people may be may have their own habits the bad habits and then the, no matter what bad habits i have finally i have to get hold of this wisdom of emptiness so that i will be the freed from the chains of these bad habits and the bad habit of the attachment aversion, ignorance, so forth, and eventually be free from all the fears. So attachment, aversion, and ignorance, they attract the fears. While I don't like the fear, but I'm so addicted to getting into these, uh, the, the factors, mental emotions, which attract the fear. So 
they find that this is the wisdom. This is the, the ultimate remedy to get rid of all my fears. This conviction we must gain in this life. And if possible, I would really, really uh, the uh, say, suggest, recommend, and even appeal that each one of us, each one of you, each one of us, we must try to get a glimpse of our emptiness in this life. We must, we must. And taking, having taken birth to human life, and we never know what kind of birth we'll take in the next life. What kind of the, the, what kind of the, say the situation, environment that will take birth in the next life. We never know. In this life, we already came in contact with the incredibly brilliant Nalanda tradition. So why not we make the most of that? And uh, the unique thing about the Nalanda tradition is about the wisdom of emptiness and bodhicitta. And along with all the other the sophisticated parts there, these are the two main things. And just see that in this life, we get a glimpse of emptiness. And we get some flavor of it. For the bodhicitta, I say intellectually to glimpse or to get a glimpse of bodhicitta, um, it's okay. It's, it's, it's not that difficult, but to really feel the experience, that will take a lot of time for bodhicitta. So in this life, just see that, that having taken human birth, say, and eventually we have to leave this world, say, all these, the, I think about like 1.5 billion human beings, like 200 years ago. It was about like 1.5 1, 1. billion human beings. Today is 8 billion human beings. So 200 years ago, 1.5 billion human beings on planet Earth were there. And at the time of Buddha, I think it was like 200 or 300 millions human beings on planet Earth. On planet Earth, 200 million human beings. Just 200 million. Now even one country has like, I say the, the, the billion, 1 billion. So at the time of the Buddha, there are like 200 millions. And then the, like 200 years ago, there are about like 1.5 billion human beings. Where are these 1.5 billion human beings today? Not even a single person alive today, to be very really honest. And where are they all gone? So after about 100 years, 150 years, not even a single person today of the 8 billion human beings will survive then. So the point is that we are here. Uh, we have taken birth as human birth, as, the, as a human. We are so fortunate. So why not we make the most of this rather than just spending um, the wasting our youth, wasting our youth in this business, that business. We have to do business. We have to do work for our living, but not invest everything on this. There's something which is more important, more meaningful, and really, really, really more meaningful to do in our life to look for the wisdom of emptiness and bodhicitta. For single point of meditation, of course, we need that, but this is not something uh, the new which the Buddha brought. It existed way before the Buddha Shakyamuni came to earth. But the bodhicitta and the wisdom of emptiness, these are two things which the Buddha brought for the first time on this planet Earth. And we must make the most of our life today uh, to see that we get a glimpse of what emptiness is and feel the awe, the wonder, the awe of the wisdom of emptiness and feel the expansiveness of the joy of the bodhicitta. This is what we, we must do, you and I. We all must try in this life. This is one thing. So with this in mind and the um, with the best of the intention uh, for the benefit of all the dear mother sentient beings, not really, not as that, okay, not like, okay, I'm doing for you. Not like that. I'm doing for myself. Therefore, I'm protecting you for myself. Because some people, uh, some people, they were born with the in, some kind of natural tendency to take care of others. And when I when I say that, and the yes, many of them are some of them are very steady. They really take care of others, no matter what others do to you. They see that benefit others is the purpose of life. This is so precious. But many of us, they see that yes, benefit others is that the purpose of life. Meanwhile, you do everything for others. And finally, when you are into difficulty, nobody comes to rescue you, then you lose faith in the humanity. So this is where your altruism is, is shaky. Now the point is that uh, the when you talk about the real altruism, skillful altruism, bodhicitta altruism, there we begin with ourselves. 
finally, I should be protected. I should be happy. I should not suffer. For that, we come to realize that the more we think wisely, we think that taking care of others is the best way to take care of yourself. This is beautiful. It's amazing. So the great event masters, they say that the Buddha uses the spear of ego to kill ego. So we, we are born with the, the, the manner in which Charles Darwin said, the selfish genes. We have the gene of selfishness. And we don't, we don't really have to be shy, feel shy, embarrassed that, oh, I'm born with the selfishness. So you use the selfishness to destroy the selfishness and you experience the infinite happiness. This is amazing. So to take care of the others in the maximum way, this is the best way to take care of yourself. So win-win situation. And that too, is not, it should not be left on the level of just a talk or nice lecture. It should be on the level of the conviction. You must gain this conviction that taking care of others is the best way by which to take care of yourself, that you don't take birth in the lower realms, that you don't have to suffer unnecessarily, and that the everything is in favor of your Dharma practice, in favor of your happiness, increasing happiness, and so forth. That is so precious. Okay. Having said this, uh, the... Um, let I become Buddha for the benefit of all my dear mother sentient beings. Okay, with this in mind, even verbally, we will say this three times together. So this is experience of the Bodhisattva will take a long time. And um, it's not that you know what is Bodhisattva. It's not that it's not sufficient that you know how to practice the Bodhisattva. It's not just sufficient that you are actually practicing Bodhisattva. The thing is that the, it takes a long time. There's a time factor involved there. And uh, with this, we just keep practicing it, keep practicing it. And that too, don't just wait for a session, a proper session to sit for the bodhicitta practice. Proper session is so important. Meanwhile, take every opportunity. For example, what we discussed last time, even let's say that you say the uh, boiling food, the, the making of food, and then the hot water, instead of just the pouring it down into the sink, remember all the millions of the, the worms there. If I do that, then all these will be badly, badly injured and they'll be killed. And the um, so killed, then two thoughts. One is that I will accumulate negative karma, number one. Number two, Oh, I should be feeling compassion towards them. I should not let them suffer. There are two things. One is out of fear for yourself. The other one is out of compassion. And both are required. Both are required. And particularly the second one is very high level. High level. These are the factors. For example, you go out, say in the aeroplane, or in the fold, the in the in the wilderness, in the forest, or on the ocean, or on the, the just in your car or they're just walking around the, the park. 
Pray for all these creatures. Your compassion increases. So these are the, and the skillful ways by which to take advantage of every opportunity for every possible time opportunity for you to grow your bodhicitta. So it's a time factor. Time factor doesn't mean that, okay, you do a session practice on bodhicitta, then within a span of 10 years, 20 years, you will have a bodhicitta. No, it's about this efficiency, how you make the most of the 24 hours, even while sleeping. In you, you just like put your head on the bed and you think about the bodhicitta. May I just say this? May I become Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings? May my happiness, for example, you feel you, you lie down and then you or today you just contemplate, contemplate on what you did the whole day. Oh, it was so meaningful day, and I really feel happy. So may I share this happiness with all the dear and sentient beings. So these are the skillful means by which. Uh, that your compassion is constantly activated. So these are the, so the more you do that, quicker the bodhisattva will arise within us and quicker you will feel the expansiveness of your heaven. Then you'll see that uh, the, uh, that the Buddha's teachings, this is the legacy. This is the, one of the greatest of the legacies of the Buddhist hegemony for us. Compassion, unconditional compassion, the bodhicitta, and of his mindfulness. So, with this mind, verbally, let us invoke the spirit. May I become Buddha for the benefit of sentient beings. Together, three times. May I become Buddha for the benefit of all my dear mother sentient beings. May I become Buddha for the benefit of all my dear mother sentient beings. May I become Buddha for the benefit of all my dear mother sentient beings. Okay, with this most beautiful the mind that you can possibly think, think of existing in this universe, this Bodhijita is the one. With this in mind, let us recite the following verses together. <clears throat> And as we recite the month, they, as we recite these verses, uh, I can see that many of you already know the meanings. But should there be one or two who need a little bit of clarification here, I'd like to explain this or to revise as a vision. I'm going to explain this very quickly here. Uh, in fact, uh, the so how effective is going to be your uh, spending time to generate bodhicitta? It depends on how effectively, how say the succinctly you understand uh, the the meanings. And uh, the how precisely, how powerfully you understand them, you could feel the meanings of the ver the, the ver verses. So the first the first verse, um, the is very comprehensive. It says that the so you have already the, created the, the commitment. May I become Buddha for the benefit of demons and beings? When you say this, uh, then that this is journey of attaining Buddhahood. Gade gade bara gade bara sam gade bodhiswaha. So I'm going to reach the bodhiswaha. This is what you are saying, what you are mentally thinking. So uh, this is a journey which is uh, the kind, which is a kind which we have never undertaken thus far, uh, which means that we are going to a totally unknown place. Because of this, we need a great support. And the greatest of, of the support that we can think of are the trouble trouble gen. So the first line says, I go for refuge to the trouble gem as a support for me to guide, for you know, three trouble gem to guide me to this unknown place of enlightenment for the band for ultimate and beings. So this journey involves involves a road, and that the, the road uh, should not be blocked by the the boulders or the foreign trees and so forth. And the road is none other than your own, your own mind. And this, your mind, and the road of your mind should not be blocked by the negativities. If there are heavy negativities, no matter what you do, no point. I say the, um, the negativities will overwhelm your positive practice. So you have to get rid of these, the negativities, the borders, the foreign trees, and so forth. So the road is clear. So uh, the best way by which to do so in a very the if, efficient way is to confess the negativities individually. So the second line says, I confess the negativ negativities individually. Now that the road is clear, but if your car doesn't have enough fuel, 
Again, we see that you cannot undertake the journey. So the car is none other than only own mind. And this mind must, must have the inner fuel of the virtues. And how they could gather such virtues within a short span of time in, a, in the most effective way is by rejoicing in the virtues of yourself, in the virtues of all the Buddhist Bodhisattvas, in the virtues of all the other beings. So Thurban says, I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. So now that you have a great support of the Triple Gem, your road is clear, and your car is in a fuel, the next question is, what kind of journey are you going to undertake? So you say, I'm going to undertake the journey of enlightenment. The fourth line says, I hold the precious brotherhood in my heart. Okay, so let's say this three times together wholeheartedly, but reflect on the meanings. I go for refuge to the triple gem. I confess the negativities individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. I hold the precious brotherhood in my heart. I go for refuge to the triple gem. I confess the negativities individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. I hold the precious brotherhood in my heart. I go for refuge to the triple gem. I confess the negativities individually. I rejoice in the virtues of all the beings. I hold the precious Buddha in my heart. Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, please pay heed to me. Just as previous Buddhas have generated the mind of Bodhicitta, and just as they successfully dwell in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise for the benefit of all sentient beings, I will generate the mind of Bodhicitta, and I shall have two successful train the Bodhisattva practices. Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, please pay heed to me. Just as previous Buddhas have generated the mind of Bodhicitta, and just as they successfully dwell in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise for the benefit of all sentient beings, I will generate the mind of Bodhicitta, and I shall have two successful train the Bodhisattva practices. Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, please pay heed to me. Just as previous Buddhas have generated the mind of Bodhicitta, and just as they successfully dwell in the Bodhisattva practices, likewise for the benefit of all sentient beings, I will generate the mind of Bodhicitta, and I shall have two successful train the Bodhisattva practices. Okay, so as what is indicated here, uh, that the um, just the previous Buddhas have generated the mode of enlightenment and engaged in Bodhisattva practices. I will also engage, I will also generate the powerful Bodhicitta and engage in Bodhisattva practices. When I say that, I will also attend the uh, engagement practices of the Bodhisattvas to attain the Buddhahood, to attain the goal of perfection. So when you say this, the simple analogy that I'll like to give you is in relation to the in relation to the uh, the sutra, Saristhamba Sutra, or the Rice Sitting Sutra, Sutra on Independent Origination, in connection with this, how to see this relation, how this sutra is so precious, is that let's take the example of the, each one of us, you and me, each one of us, we, I think, we're becoming, a, let's say, a professor, a professor in physics, and uh, you, are in a, you are in a school or you're in a college, let's say, and then I like to become a uh, the uh, professor of physics. So here, the number one, that you should have an incredible, let's say the, what actually uh, gives you the, the, the credential uh, to be um, as a factor for your, uh, for your becoming professor in physics is your, the academic performance and how intelligibly, how sharp, what kind of, say, the inventions, what kind of discoveries that you've made. So that acquire a very sharp intelligence. Wisdom is required. So, so whereas if you, are, if you don't have this intelligence while you're in college, while you say that I'm going to become uh, the professor in physics, and um, so there in college, your mathematical skill is two plus five equals 10. And if this is your mathematical skill, two plus five equals 10 in your college days, you can't really expect to become a professor in physics. So to become a professor in physics, you should have enough intelligence. So likewise to attain Buddhahood, Buddhahood is greater than attaining, becoming a professor in physics. You require incredible intelligence. The wisdom is required, number one. Now let's say that in your class, um, the, there are some students, some gifted students with incredible intelligence, but these people are always found in the pubs. Always found in the pubs. Always. And do you expect that this person who is so intelligent, so brilliantly gifted with intelligence, 
can become a Nobel laureate, can become a, the uh, professor in physics. Not really. What is missing? Anyone? What is missing? Anyone? Presents? What is missing with this, this second? Okay, Johan, Johan, Brucher. By the way, first, uh, please tell me um, how you pronounce your name, Johan or Johan? Johan. Johan, thank you. Johan, yeah. Yes. I think the, the ethics is missing. The right conduct. Mm. Okay, so the, the, uh, let's say that there's another person who's so intelligent and never goes to pubs, never goes to pubs, never create any problem there, right? Very relaxed, easygoing, not with the books, music, right? What's the problem with this person? I don't think that even this person can become a, the, a good professor in physics. Anyone? Resents quick. Resents. Okay. Taruna. Uh, Geshala, enthusiasm or motivation is missing. Okay, how many agree with Tarunara's hands? Enthusiasm, motivation is, you know, is missing. And so although, yes, I want to become a professor in physics, but it's very superficial enthusiasm. The real enthusiasm is tested how you perform on a daily basis. You're getting it? Enthusiasm is missing. If you are really serious about it, you will not find yourself in pubs all the time. You will not find, find yourself in the mood with the music all the time with no books. Enthusiasm is missing. Now, I say you, each one of us, you, incredibly gifted with the intelligence. And you are so enthusiastic, you prove your enthusiasm every day. Right? What is the possibility for this person to become a good professor in physics? The chance is very high. Raise hands. Chance is very high. Good. So therefore, to become a professor in physics and to become a Buddha, to know every phenomenon, uh, to become a Buddha is more difficult. If to become a professor, you require these two things. One, the great degree of intelligence. And number two, the, the enthusiasm. To become a Buddha, you need to these two things in the most intense form. One is the wisdom and the other is the enthusiasm. So what is that enthusiasm? That enthusiasm is the desire to become Buddha for the benefit of all dear mothers and human beings. That is enthusiasm. That's, that Buddhist that's the enthusiasm and the wisdom is the liberating path. There's the X to cut the, uh, cut this poisonous tree of the afflictive obscurations and the of obscurations. The X, that is the wisdom to cut the the poisonous tree, but this wisdom should be, this X should be used by somebody with enthusiasm. If the person just hit the, the tree once with a very sharp X, hit it once and keep it there and you keep, you keep drinking tea and listen to music and you're not too serious, okay, now I'm feeling a little tired, I go to, a, I take a siesta, right? If this is, if this is the, the attitude, impossible to cut this huge tree, chronic disease of the um, afflictive obscurations, chronic obscurations. So therefore, there's no time for siesta. You're getting it? If you want to cut this, the, the enthusiasm must be so intense. There's a Bodhisattva enthusiasm. So these two things are required. Now, how do we relate this to the Raya Seedling Sutra? That these two things, these two things, happen only by dependence on their corresponding causes, but dependent origination. They originate by dependence on the corresponding causes. For example, what is enlightenment? To, to have this bodhi, bodhicitta, you need to know what is enlightenment, what is bodhi. You need to know how to attain that. And at the moment, I don't have this enthusiasm. How to build this enthusiasm? Even this enthusiasm also comes into being, originates by dependence on the other factors. What are the factors missing? You have to, you have to create these factors dependent upon which the enthusiasm is originated. So intelligence, the wisdom, when that is lacking, it's not that you are inborn with the, you, you, are, you have the inborn lack of intelligence. No. If you do display lack of intelligence, this is a superficial quality, superficial attribute. Your true nature is 
brilliant, blazing with intelligence. That's the true nature. Everyone has a true nature of the blazing intelligence and the blazing bodhicitta. But why do we don't display them? Because they're obscured by the Falman's laziness, not wanting to study, not wanting to remove the ignorance. Then they, you're blind, you are, say, the always veiled by ignorance. Veiled by ignorance means that you don't have the wisdom. So you have to remove this factor, factor of ignorance, dependent upon which lack of intelligence comes to you. So now removing it and replacing it with the enthusiasm of studies, reflection, and meditation, then the dependence on these, your intelligence is originated, dependent on origination. So for this, um, before we actually uh, engage in these, uh, the corresponding content, the, the concomitant courses for cultivating the wisdom and the enthusiasm bodhicitta, um, first of all, we need to convince of that. For example, what happened was that the, um, many years ago, I think about like 16, 17 years ago, there were two girls who came to, just the, the one was just 19 years old and the other one was, I think, 20 or 21 years old. They came to see me about like 20 years ago. No, not 20, 17 years ago. And uh, they, both of them, the younger one, elder one was, they, I would say that the elder one seemed to be, uh, they say, quicker in learning and can penetrate things more sharply. Then after a while, after about like uh, the 10, to 10, 11 years, the, um, the younger ones stick to learning the Nalanda studies. And the elder one quit. Quit meaning that jumped into something else with Buddhism, but something else. Then once in a while we met, elder one also we met, and then I came to sense that the elder one is not really with these systematic studies. So they, she sounded was very intelligent. Then I told her that, okay, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, you can do. That's fine. But in this life, you must try to get a glimpse of emptiness. This is what I told her. And they, uh, she said that, but getting the glimpse of emptiness, will it really help? help you to remove uh, to attain nirvana and enlightenment this is what she said so what i'm saying is that on uh, the same uh, the say you have to have the bodhicitta the greatest enthusiasm greatest of the intelligence the wisdom of emptiness you must have to have this too but how you have to do this, this, this these factors you have to create these factors dependent upon which Depend wisdom of emptiness will be originated, depending on which the bodhicitta will be originated. But are they really connected like this? Are they really dependent on each other like this? Is that dependent origination? Does it really work? Is it, does it really work? Which means that conviction is not coming. So they say, for example, doing virtues will give you happiness. Doing non-virtues will give you suffering. Studying, say for example, even in a secular sense, say going to school, colleges, and being very consistent with your studies will give you a more meaningful life. And always being lazy, staying away from shaking your classes, and so forth, um, likelihood that you will not really succeed in your life. This is a dependent origination. This is a, where the dependent origination operates. And when you are not convinced with this, then people will go for shortcuts. For example, like to get a lot of money, will get into, say, the corruption or this, this, this smuggling and drug trafficking and so forth. All these things one engages in because you get the, the, the money easily. But what for the money? For my happiness. Does it really give you happiness? It destroys your happiness. This is reality. So not knowing the principle of cause and effect, principle, principle of dependent origination, then you, we tend to go into the wrong actions with the intention, with aspiration to acquire a re desired result. 
which which does not accord with the uh, principle of dependent origination. And principle of dependent origination is not what the Buddha Shakyamuni invented, the Buddha Shakyamuni discovered. For example, say the word uh, the Albert Einstein, and he is he was really very much in in line with I uh, say the of course his concept of the dependent origination is in the context of the physical world, saying that physical world operates on a basis of cause and effect. So he was totally against the uh, the the concept of randomness in quantum mechanics. He was totally against that. Albert Einstein, because he said that the world cannot operate on the random principle. It must operate on the basis of the cause and effect. This is what he said. So, and then, and he also, of course, is gifted with intelligence. We all know that. For example, he said that, so actually, this is what most of us do, tend to do that. Say, um, say if there is a television set, and the television set, it doesn't work. It stops working. And then what you do is that the um, you hit the television set and somehow accidentally it works. And you uh, hitting the television set, it will not fix the problem. But maybe if the, the wire is loose, hitting accidentally, it joins. And then it works for a while. It's very temporary. And again, it breaks. Again, you hit, 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 and gradually it becomes worse, 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 worse. Right, and then later on, it come it becomes too worse to the extent that even the mechanics will say they better dump it, right? Okay, so this says what happens, and he said Albert Einstein said by he said that by resorting to the method which failed to give you the result, no matter how much you do the same method, the result will never arise. This is what Albert Einstein said. This is amazing. It's just a concept of dependent origination. He said that by dependence, this particular, say the your action, if the result did not come, the result did not come, which means that no matter how much you do the same thing, you will never get the result. Because this result that you're expecting is not concomitant with the action that you're doing. So the result must be there's a concomitancy between the result and the action that one engages in. So therefore, Arasanga indicated the, the three conditions. Condition, unwavering condition, condition of impermanence, and the third one is the condition of potentiality. That the cause must have the potential to give rise to the result. If it does not have the potential to give rise to the result, no matter how you engage in the same cause, over and over again, the result will never arise. Okay. So with this in mind, the first thing that we need to learn is how to gain conviction in the principle of dependent origination, how the universe operates on the basis of dependent origination. If you fail to get this conviction, then the most likely we will always engage in the wrong causes, expecting a desired goal, which will never happen. And then we'll always be frustrated. We'll continue to the, the uh, say, delve into miseries. Okay, so therefore, this is so important. So with this in mind, let's continue reading from where we left yesterday. And if you could remember um, the, what I said yesterday, was that when the things happen, there's a human psyche within us. Human psyche can most likely go into two directions. One, blind faith. The manner, the, the, the manner in which uh, the one that came to me when I was in South India, uh, where we get the water only from the underground because it's very far away from the, uh, the Himalayas, Himalayan snow mountains. So we get the only source of water is the underground. And then the, I was just, just the random thought came to me yesterday, what I shared with you, that how did the, the earth, how did he keep the water for us? Those in the plains, how did they keep the water for us? It came from where? 
Is there somebody is always filling this water on the ground? There's nobody filling the water there. But then where does this come from? This question. Yes, it came from some, some other water source flowing underground. And eventually it's a stream outside. Stream outside from the glaciers. And from the glacier it has come from the snow mountain. So real source is a snow mountain. And then the next to the snow mountain, you can get the water very easily, glaciers. And then next to the glaciers, you can get the water very easily through the stream rivers then the then down the plains if the river flows too much on the surface then the river will be evaporated so the 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 river flows underground not on the surface that's amazing evaporation will not take place so the water will be conserved and then people in the plain they can they have um, the bore well and take water from the underground that's amazing. And then what? But then the source, the water will be finished. Don't worry. The, all the water will go into the ocean. You dump into the ocean. And the ocean, again, somebody will uh, evaporate this ocean. Take the water from the ocean to the Mount Everest, Himalaya. How do you do that? They evaporate this. Sun will evaporate this. And they, it, will take in the, it, will not, it cannot flow directly from the ocean to the Mount, uh, Mount Everest. So first it has to be lifted up in the sky. That's amazing. So the water will not be lifted in the form of the vapor, it will be lifted. And then the, it is taken there in the form of the cloud. The cloud is pushed by the wind. That's amazing. And it does not shower on the, the plains. It showers the snow in the plains. It will create the snow and then put it on the, 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 what, the, the high altitude, like the Mount Everest, Himalayas. They put it there. And it's not like in the form of water, not, not like a cloud burst, but uh, in the form of snow, so that the water can be, uh, you can remain there for a longer time. And then the water we have to get, uh, it should be sustained, it should be sustainable. So it'll be, it'll melt gradually. That's amazing. Who's doing this? This was a question. Overall, who's doing this? Big question. So in my mind, Oh, there must be some external agent there, like a god, creator god, someone who's dictating. So the blind faith comes in. So in, in, in the with this, if you really think about this, we take for granted, usually these things, we take for granted. Even the, how the human body works, this is amazing. How the human body works, it's amazing. Where, say there's something there, you call it karma or whatever, when that is not there, no matter what, no matter what, you have uh, the, say the, uh, the, even the blood, even the blood, it can, the blood vessel can erupt inside the body and it can damage the whole, you can die very easily. Post, the blood poisoning can happen. Whereas we, the, say when the karma is there, then blood inside never clots. But if there's a cut, blood can come out. And if the the, the the keeps but if the blood keeps flowing, then you will die. No, don't worry. The moment the blood comes out, it'll clot, right? Some agent will be there to stop it. It'll clot, and then the blood stops. That's amazing. We never thought about these things. We never thought about these things. These are wonders. It's amazing. So when we think about this, then who who is doing that? For example, the brain, one part of the brain is damaged. Then the say the, the for example, say your eyesight, your eyesight, that is damaged. Oftentimes, people may the neuroscientists may say that is this a miracle. Then some other part of the, the brain will take charge of the the work which the, the first part of the brain could not do anymore. Second part of the brain will. They take the responsibility of the, the first part of the brain and continue, continue to have the eyesight. But it does not happen to everybody, only to some. That's amazing. How does the brain know that now this poor brain, part of the brain is not working? I should help, right? I should jump to rescue that. Amazing. So who is doing this? If you think about this, oftentimes there are miracles happening everywhere, yet we take for granted. You take for granted. And as they say, then when you really think about these things, these thoughts come to you, 
you'll be fascinated. Most likely you will go into the blind faith that there's a creator there who is creating these things for us. This is one thing. The next part is that, no, these are all random. So what? Look at the, look at the beans. They are so round. Who's making them round? No one, right? So for example, say the, uh, say um, this pen, this pencil. This pencil, it is round. It's round, it's made by a machine. But the bean, the roundness of the bean, who makes it? Nobody makes it. But the Michelangelo's paintings, Michelangelo's the sculptures, they're so beautifully done. From just look at it, we see that somebody has done it. But look at the peacocks, peacock feathers. Who painted this? Nobody painted it. It's natural, it's random. So second group is totally agnostic, not an agnostic, totally a disbeliever. That is just randomness. They don't really think deep, hedonistic. It's just random. The first part is blind faith. Oh, there's some creator there. So these are the, the two ten, the ten tendencies the human, human psyche can uh, slide into. Now there's a third one, to know the reality, then act accordingly. What's the reality? The reality of dependent origination, that the sun does not, the sun does not intend to save us. No, sun does not intend to save us. Sun is just the, the burning of the, the fuel of the hydrogen. For the hydrogen, and when the hydrogen finishes off to become helium, finished, the sun dies. Sun does not have any intention. Because of the sun, then the water on the ocean, they are evaporated. They evaporated by the gravity, the principle of the gravity, what is lighter will come on the surface. What is lighter will come on the surface, what is heavier will go down, closer to the earth. So the water, air, air molecule, the, what is that? The vapor, uh, vapor molecules, they are lighter, they are coming to the surface in the sky. Nobody's lifting them up. It's just dependent on origination. And then the fact that there's the wind blowing, and then it blows, and particularly where, say, the, there's an object there, it is pulled by that. What is the object? The high objects. What is higher? The, the, uh, the cloud is high in the sky, it's closer. The, this is one, instead of the closer to the closer towards the, say, the Himalayas, which is very high, they are very on a parallel level. So they'll be pulled the air. And then the concentration, because that, because when it becomes too heavy, it cannot contain any more. So there's known as condensation and then precipitation. Then it, it releases. Not that, it, okay, now it's time for me to release average Himalaya. No, that it becomes so heavy, it cannot contain it any more. Automatically then it, the, it is released. And then because that it is on a very high level, high level, there's the, the temperature very low. So therefore the snow happens. But the snow, it's not that the snow model, okay, now I have the enough snow. Now I have to make sure that I regulate the melting. No, it depends on that sometimes the melting happens so fast. Sometimes the melting happens so less, depending on the intensity of the sun. And with the say global warming, in the, the one the melting happens even faster. So these are all dependent on origination. Now from this, if you think more deeply, then we see that there's one element which is working. I say collectively, we see that there's something like a design there. What is that? There's no external agent. If there's an external agent, there's so much contradictions there. External agent to, to decide that. There are so many contradictions. Why do other things require external agent? Why the external agent does not require another agent to create that? All these questions are there. And what's the nature of the external agent? When you question all these things, there are so many contradictions there. So, so it's not about this. Okay, let's not forget that it's not about the systems. It's not about the traditions. It's about your well-being. So when people believe in some agents, why should we have to, why should we have to uh, say the undermine them? It is they believe, respect them. Because of this belief, so many people have benefited. Otherwise, many people can easily go into corruption, easily go into uh, say the killing, stealing and so forth. And because of such belief, they have, they have the, the fear. If I engage in these bad things, then I'll be punished. So that saved them from engaging in negative karmas. They're so precious. But for you, 
you are experiencing the fearlessness and infinite happiness. And knowing the reality of dependent origination, that the two sources of joy and happiness within us. And how to uncover that is by removing the mental dirts. How to remove the dirts is by dependence on these factors that the removal of the dirt will originate, dependent origination. So if you know the dependent, how the universe operates on the basis of dependent origination, then you know how to act properly. And this, the knowledge will help us the, not only for you to act properly, that this is a factor which will help us to make the whole world peaceful. You don't have to convert anybody. If they told you want to convert, you convert somebody who's unhappy to a happy person. Somebody who is sad to a happy person. Somebody who doesn't know how to, to, how to deal with the family members. Make that person, convert that person to become a very responsible family member. That is what should be intended. And finally, let them all unravel the hidden treasure inside. No need for one to be labeled as I'm Buddhist. No need that you should follow the Buddhism. No, just unravel your hidden treasure. That's it. And this hidden treasure existed way before Buddhism came on this earth. So these are the, the, the benefit of understanding dependent origination. And the concept of dependent origination is what the Buddha discovered. He did not invent, he did not invent it. So it existed way before that. We just uncover it, unlock this concept of dependent origination, and then, then we'll know how to act properly so that we can expect the desired goal to happen. Okay, so continue reading from where we left yesterday. Okay. Mm -hmm. Page number 66, okay. 66. So how is the conditional relation in outer dependent arising? Okay, first, uh, so there are four key words. Outer dependent arising, inner dependent arising, then the conditional and causal. There are four key words. Outer, inner, conditional, causal. We need to remember these. If you want to remember the easy in an easy way, let's say the outer and the inner. Within the outer, we talk about the causal and conditional. Within the inner, again, causal, conditional. Then it becomes four. Okay. So let's say, what is outer? What is the inner? Inner meaning the, the sentient beings, like yourself, like myself. How the sentient beings they are, they are referred to as the inner and how they come into existence by dependent origination. What about outer? Outer meaning the inanimate objects, for example, like the table, the flower, the vegetations, the, the, the world, the Milky Way galaxy, the universe, and so forth, and atoms, electrons, and so forth. All these inanimate objects are form the outer dependent origination. So what is causal and what is conditional? Causal means the primary cause, primary the primary causes responsible for giving rise to a result in the form of outer or in the form of inner. And what is conditional? Conditional meaning the secondary factors required for this primary cause to uh, to become active to give rise to the result. The secondary factors refer to as the conditions, conditional. Okay, so this causes the causal and the conditional related to the Outer dependent origination and causal conditional related to, to the inner dependent origination. So now what we are reading is conditional relation in outer dependent arising the, for the, let's say, the flower. As due to the coming together of six elements, so the, the conditional, the six elements, the uh, causal in terms of the seed as a cause to give rise to a sprout, sprout giving rise to the, the pedestal, Pedestal given rise to the pistol, pistol given rise to the flower, flower given rise to the fruits. So that is the causal. Now the six elements come into play. Six elements, elements they are called as the conditions. How? As due to coming together of which six elements? Namely, 
Conditional dependent arising is to, is to be seen uh, due to the coming together of the elements of earth, water, fire, air, space, and okay, here they translate, they translate it as season, and they, we can also translate it as time, time, space and time. So it so happened that with the, with the outer dependent origination, such as the flower, uh, we can say the season, but otherwise it is a time. Time, I would say time is better, but season fits so well in this case. So the four major elements, earth, fire, water, air, then the two, space and time, space and time. And um, the, the earth element, how does the earth element serve as a condition for the outer dependent origin of the flower? Earth element functions as a support for the seed. Earth element as a support of the seed. For example, say the seed has to be planted in the, er the, in the earth as a support. The water element moistens the seed. And uh, the, the seed can be apple seed with the same water, water element. It can the seed can be apple seed or mango seed. If it is mango seed, it will only give rise to mango, no matter uh, the which water. Then with if, uh, apple seed, it will only give rise to the apple tree, not the mango tree. So, but the water remains the same. Therefore, this is the, these are the conditions, not as the primary cause. The water element moistens seed. The fire element ripens seed. Just think of these, these details, they will give us a deeper conviction in the efficacy of the dependent origination. Then in your next life, when somebody takes you into the blind faith, you will not be too happy. This something is not right. The world operates very differently, and here, whereas the people around me, they follow blindly. Okay, um, when I was in class, particular class 9, 10, 11, 12, when I was age, um, the, say, um, the 16, 17, 18, um, I was introduced to physics, um, to physics as a separate subject. And uh, the, then I started to learn how to question asking questions to all what I learned before, I started to ask questions to them. And then to my surprise, many of the seniors, the elders around, around this young boy, I asked questions about Buddhism to them. They were all following blindly. They did not really have a sound, say the reasons or explanation. I was quite, quite the, uh, surprised by this. So, this would be the benefit for us that in the future lifetimes we may not really slide down into not the say the blind faith, and we will follow into the principle of dependent origination, and then you can actually get there where you intend to to reach. Okay. The water element moistens the seed. The water element moistens the seed. Yes, that is. The fire element ripens the seed, and this seed. How the, 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 it is ripened, for example, say when we cook the food, we put on the fire, then it is being cooked, getting cooked. And the, say the unripened fruits, when you put in the, when you put in the sun, in the hot sun, then it ripens so fast. So the fire element ripens the seed. Air element opens the seed. Air elements, the mobility there. Open means there should be the opening, the, 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 say the, this movement happening, mobility. Air element opens the seed. The space element performs the function of not obstructing the seed. Seed has to, has to be germinated and has to open. The element of space gives the space uh, for it to, to open. And the season of the, of the time transform the seed and the season in this context is very relevant because that it's not that uh, that you put water on the uh, the apple seed then the, the mango mango tree will give mangoes at all the year year round no it doesn't give mangoes year round it only gives the, the mangoes i think around the, the summer i think if i'm not wrong summer a uh, summer only one season not all the seasons, despite you having all the other factors intact, the season or the time transforms the seed to give rise to the fruits. Without these conditions are sprout. And then here in these, when these things are happening, there's no agent who is dictating that, hey, water, now you have to moisten the seed. No, the, the moment the, the seed is, comes in contact with the, the water, 
it is moistened. The moment the seed comes in contact with the fire element, the heat, then it is ripened. The moment the, um, the seed comes in contact with the air, it, it makes the mobility to open. And the moment it comes in, because of the availability of space, it has a space to, to open. And then the, finally, with the season, with the time, with the time, with a particular time, and then it transforms into the flower, fruits, and so forth. There's no external agent there. Without these conditions, a sprout cannot uh, form uh, from a seed. But when the outer element of earth is not deficient, and likewise water, air, fire, space, season are not deficient, then from the coming together of all these factors, sprout forms as the seed is seizing. As the seed seizes, then the sprout is formed. There's purely dependent origination. There's no agent involved there. Okay. And <clears throat> so the more we study these, your conviction, yes, that's very true. That's very true. The more you say, the more mentally you feel that that's very true. That's very true. Your conviction in the law of the dependent origination becomes deeper, deeper, deeper. Then it will take you away and away from the, more and more away from, are the blind faith. This is so precious. Then you will become very practical and realistic person. The next, earth element does not think, I support the seed. Nor does the water element think, I must not seed. No, they do not think like this. So sometimes I jokingly say that if you are in the, what is that, the, uh, what is that mountain from where the snow, the river Ganga comes? Huh? <laughs> okay, what is this? I forgot the dum dum huh? Gangudri, oh. all these Tibet house young stuff. They say all the funny things. Yeah, okay, the Gangudri. So the Yandela, yeah, he said it correctly. Okay, Gangudri. If you're in Gangudri, and they uh, say if you're in France. And you want to go to, let's say, India, and they, you don't know how to go there. And if you have, say, like, um, the, uh, say, like Anna Sophie with you, she will take you to India without any problem because she knows how to come to India. So likewise, so which means that you need somebody who knows the, 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 the way or the, 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 the route or the route. Americans will call it a route and the British will call it route. Okay, um, <clears throat> say if you're in Gangotri, and if you want to go to, if you want to go to Bay of Bengal, the sea there, Bay of Bengal, and if you have no guide, like Anna Sophie is missing there, uh, you have no guide there, then what do you do? The best thing is jump into River Ganga, right? Ganga, will Ganga is the best guide. It'll take you there. First, it'll, it'll take you to Rishikesh, then to Varanasi, then to Ganga, then to Bay Bengal, right? So this river Ganga does not take, will not think, okay, don't worry, you jump into me, I'll take you there. No, river Ganga does not think like this. In river Ganga, you see, you take any, the, say, chunk of water, any volume of water, you see that there's no animate there. It's totally inanimate. Yet, how it operates on the basis of the, the gravity, the gravity and the, the landscape and the gravity combined together and the say, access to the water on the Gango tree, access to the water, all the, but depends on all these factors, it cannot stay there. It has to flow, flow from the higher state to the lower state because of the gravity. Because of gravity. Why not to, from B, why not only through A? Because of landscape. So this is dependent origination, but depends on these factors, then the water flowing in this particular A direction is originated. This purely dependent origination. And this Gangotri, this river Ganga does not tell you that, okay, don't worry, I'll take you there, I'll guide you there to Bay Bengal. No, you just jump in and by dependent origin, it will throw you into the Bay Bengal. This dependent origination. So the point is that river Ganga does not, does not think that I'm taking you to Bay Bengal. But it takes you there. So this purely dependent origination. So now with the, say, the animate objects, like a mother taking the child 
or um, help uh, take the person to another place. Okay, I'm taking you to this place, don't worry. So there is the element of intention involved. Okay. <clears throat> God, is that? The earth element does not think. I support, I support the seed. Nor does the water element think I'm most in the seed. Yes. Nor does the fire element think I wrap in the seed. Nor does the air element think I open the seed. Nor does the space element think I make sure the seed is not obstructed. Nor does the season of the time think I transform the seed. Nor does the seed think I form the sprout. Nor does the sprout think I'm formed by these conditions. Yet, when these conditions are present and the seed is seizing, the sprout forms. Likewise, when finally there's no flower, the when there's a flower, the fruit is formed. The flower gives rise to the fruit. This is purely dependent on origination. The sprout is not created by itself, not created by another, meaning that the sprout, it is not created by itself and it's not created by another agent not created by both the self and another agent, not created by some external powerful agents like Ishvar. This is reality, not transformed by time. Okay, this is very important, not trans uh, transformed by time. So there, say in India, this India is amazingly, uh, say the a place, amazing place, which gave birth to so many philosophical traditions. It's amazing. So in those days, like 2000 years ago, 3000 years ago, India gave birth to so many philosophical traditions. Many thinkers came, were produced from India. And they were actually thinking. They were not really falling blindly. They were thinking. For example, they said, these people, how, you know, they, the thoughts that came to me that who's really working behind this? Say the water, uh, they say the, the melt from the Himalayas, the, the glaciers, then the, river, the rivers, then the water going down the earth, then in the plain, then thrown into the ocean, again taken back in the form of the ev evaporation, snow. Who's doing that? This question. People were thinking. In those days, people were thinking. How did this universe come into existence? Who created this universe? All these questions of thought, and some thinkers they came to their own their, their own conclusion that there is some external agent there. One within that within that, that acceptance, external agent there. There are various versions. It's not just one. Some say polytheism. Some say monotheism. It's only one creator God, one creator. Some say no, no. There are so many creators. It's not only one. Monotheism. And then the some even the, the creator, what is that creator? Is that all loving or is it like in, in the animate object? Some say it's all loving, full of wisdom, full of compassion, and full of potential. And some say, no, no, it's like inanimate object. This prakriti. Prakriti, in fact, it is like a very ordinary common person. Common person who wants to lure, for example, say is a person who wants to lure the people. The other people keep them under your, under your, I uh, say the, uh, do not the domination. Then sometimes you give presents to them, make them happy. They stay with you, and then you try to exploit them. Keep doing that. So, some of these, they they think us, they see the creator as like that agent, who's not too compassionate, who just tries to lure you, like how the some cares accept. Some you some you for them they call it the prakriti, prakriti, who creates the everything for you, for you so that you are trapped in samsara. You cannot get out of get out of samsara. You cannot attain nirvana. He creates everything for you. The moment you discover that he's creating this, he he or she, she feels shy, and then we pull back all the the manifestations or emanations. Then you are left. You are left with your nobody. Because you don't have a body, you don't feel hungry. Because you don't have a body, you don't feel uh, the cold, heat. And you don't, because you don't have a body, you don't, you, you don't have to carry, you don't have the burden of carrying your body into the aeroplane to another place. All the flight tickets, all these things become redundant, meaningless for you. It's so easy for you. This is liberation. You are liberated from hunger, thirst, cold, heat from having to pay your body, becoming ill, 
you are freed from all this this liberation so this is how they create the concept and some say that no there's nothing like prakriti it's just the physical matter particles particles are ultimate creators like today's phys physics physicists who say the particles as the, the final embodiment of the whole physical world, the particles. Some say, no, 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 time is the creator. That's amazing. These brilliant thinkers came like 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago. That's amazing. So here the time doesn't mean the time as the one of the six elements. The time here is the time as the creator. Uh, not transformed by time, not derived from prakriti. Prakriti means the agent. Agent which creates things to lure you, lure you and be that you be trapped in samsara and not born without any cause and not randomly created. And nevertheless, through the coming together of the element of earth, water, fire, air, space, and season, the season of the time, the sprout forms as the seed is seizing. This is the dependent origination. There's nothing of these agents we are which are dicta dictating on your coming to existence or, uh, or you die. Thus is the conditional relation in outer dependent arising to be seen. Here, outer dependent arising is to be seen in forms of five aspects. Now, further explanation, this is so precious, the, say, the, the teaching for us. Now, the outer dependent arising can be seen in five aspects. Again, in different explanation, five aspects. Which five? As not permanent, as not permanent. For example, like the seed given rise to the sprout. If the seed is permanent, the sprout will never come into existence. The seed will give rise to the seed. Seed will give rise to the next seed. And it will never give rise to a sprout. So that not permanent means that if you say that it gives rise to a sprout, then the sprout and seed should be the same because they is, it is believed to be permanent. If this are not same, the seed is not permanent. So as not permanent, as not discontinuous, it is not like random. Say that the seed and discontinues, and after a while, then the sprout comes. No, the time the seed ceases, the sprout comes into existence as a as a continuation. It is changing; it's not permanent, but there's a con the, the continuous there, as not con uh, the discontinuous, as not involving transmigration. This is another very important concept. We have a feeling that okay, a person dies, then the person will take birth in the, the next birth. It's also like the same person, you know, sometimes when um, in the movies, uh, the, when the, the movie about the reincarnation, say so somebody dies, lie down, the body's, body's laid down. And from there, they're very similar to this body in the form of like a, the spooky, it comes out, arise, main body remains there. It's so like in the form of the typical in the form of the physical body. No, it's not like that. So same, um, same the a dog can die and will take birth as a human being. And say the uh, same human being can die and take birth as an animal. Or a, the a female can die and um, the, can be taken birth as a male. So sometimes, okay, this is a little bit of digression. Sometimes when I was, I say, when I was, I think age five or age six, in, retros in retrospect, I, I think that my former life may be a girl. I must be a girl in my former life. You know why? Because when I was age five, six, my favorite color was pink. And then two years ago, two years ago, I ordered, what is that? The, uh, some brush, not really it's a brush, to scratch your back. What is that? A plastic, rubber, a made of rubber. And I, I ordered blue. Now they, so my thought of being a male that dominates. So when I was four, five, five, six, my favorite color was pink. That was 100% sure, nobody can deny this. And then uh, later on, then I become older, then that, that, that I'm a male, you know, that started to dominate. And the, the, now I'm not really interested in pink anymore. The, the what is that? The, uh, that some kind of attraction that, that used to come to me when I was little, when I was age five, six, um, is no more there at all nowadays. 
But what happened when I, when I ordered this, uh, the Amazon, and I ordered a blue one, not a pink, and a pink came again. <laughs> right? Okay. There's no point in complaining. It's just a waste of time. So I just accepted that. Okay. So what I'm saying is that a male can take birth as a female. A female can take birth as a male. These things can happen. So it's not that, you know, there's somebody there who, for example, I say a person here jumps from spot A to jumps to the, the, the spot B. The same person moves there. No, it's not like that. It's not like that. This is screen sharing. It's not like that. It, of course, no? And this has some. Not in all transmigration. Transmigration here meaning that meaning that the same person with the same physical body, with the same mental thinking, will move to the next life. Like a person jump, a monkey jumping from one tree to the next tree. It's not like that. Transmigration. We it has a connotation that the self being permanent. Permanent, not changing, it moves from one place to the another person. This transmigration in the form of permanent self doesn't happen. As the formation of a large result from a small scale, say a tiny seed will give rise to a huge banyan tree. A tiny seed will give rise to millions of, the, they say, the, the fruits with so millions of the seeds there. One seed, tiny seed, can give rise to numerous results. Um, what was a large seed, a large result from a small cause and as a continuity of similar type meaning that what the result is it is as similar with respect they they similar with the cause we cannot expect mangoes going out of the apple seed because apple seed and mangoes mango fruits these two are the not concomitant they should be similar in nature Okay, next. Now explaining each one of these points. How is it not permanent? Number one, not being permanent. How is it not permanent? It is not permanent because where the composite phenomena, they, if they follow the principle of dependent origination, the composite phenomena should never be permanent. How not? It is not permanent because the sprout and the seed are different. If it's permanent, the two should be same. The sprout is not a seed. The sprout does not come from the seed after it has ceased. The sprout does not, again, the sprout does not come from the seed after it has ceased. After it has ceased, meaning the seed, it ceases, give a short break, and then the sprout comes. It doesn't happen like this. Nor does it come from the seed while it has not yet ceased. The seed is there, while the seed is still there, then the sprout exists simultaneously, together. It doesn't happen like this. So how does it happen then? Then, then, the sprout is born precisely as the seed ceases. When the seed ceases, simultaneously the sprout comes into existence. Not that seed stops and then a short gap and the sprout comes. No, it's not like that. The seed stops and the sprout result comes into existence. These two are simultaneous. That seed and sprout, these two are not simultaneous. The two actions are simultaneous. While the sprout is born precisely as the seed ceases with the two actions. How is it not discontinuous? As I said, that the, the seed ceases and there's no gap. There's no gap. Instantly the sprout arises. So there is a continuum there. How is it not discontinuous? It is not discontinuous because a sprout is not born from a seed that is already ceased, meaning that a seed ceased and short gap and then the sprout arises. If that happens, there's a gap there. This continuum is broken. Um, no, from a seed that is not ceased. Okay, no, from a seed that, that is done. Rather, like the beam of a beam of a scale, a tilting. Okay, the two sides of the balance, beam of a scale, scale into balance, two sides. So when one goes down, other automatically comes up. These two happen together, simultaneous. The two reactions are simultaneous. Uh, the beam of a scale tilting from up to down. A sprout is born precisely when the seed has ceased. When the seed ceases, the sprout instantly arises, which means there's no time gap. So therefore, there's a continuum there. If there's a time gap, the continuum is broken. So therefore, it is not discontinuous. How does it not involve transmigration? Okay, transmigration, yes, of course, when we die, we migrate to the next life. But here, transmigration meaning a permanent person, 
migrates from one place to the another place. So like a monkey jumping from one place to the next, next place. So therefore, many people who believe in many, some traditions who believe in reincarnation, and they say that, they say that um, the animals will always take birth as animals. Human will, will all, always take birth as humans. So this is because of belief in the permanent self. Whereas the, the reality is very different. For example, um, the <clears throat> at the time of uh, the at the time of the Buddha, uh, this these these anecdotes we have to to know. You have to hear these anecdotes. At the time of the Buddha, uh, the um, a family has a dog, and um, the dog by the behavior of the dog, the family could make out if if the visitor is related to the Buddha or related to somebody else, not to Buddha. This dog can, the, from the behavior of the dog, the family can make out. So particularly one day, there was a monk who visited the family for arms round. And the dog behaved extremely differently that he was just so happy moving around the, the monk. As well, like the dog knows the monk for so long. And from the behavior of the dog, the family could make out that this monk is a very special monk. Then they went out, received the monk. And who, who was that monk? It was Shariputra, Arhat Shariputra. Then he was received, and the, the dog could not really leave the monk. And the bone between the, the Arhat Shariputra and the dog was built so strongly to the extent that the family thinks that the family would mentally, um, they, they think that now the dog is not really our dog, it's more like the Shariputra's dog. One day the dog passed away. And then they, because that the family sees the dog as more close to the uh, Shariputra, they requested Shariputra, what should we do with the dog's body? And Shariputra, Shariputra advised, don't worry, just bury the body in your the back the what you call, the backyard so they buried it and then a girl was born in the family after that a girl was born and the girl this little girl since the age one two showed extreme affinity and joy to see um arhat shariputra whenever arhat shariputra visits the family the girl was so happy so happy and then the girl reaches the age 5, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16. Now, when she was very young, uh, the, her behavior was more dominated by the Im mental imprints of the past life. Now reaching the age 14, 15, 16, the, the behaviors were more determined by the imprints of this new life. What is this new life? That she's a girl, and in the whole the the family, all these discussions about the marriage and all these things are going there. So the girls' thoughts were more or more influenced by this life's, uh, say, the activities. This life's activities means very different from what Shari, what Arat Shariputra teaches. So usually when the Arat Shariputra comes to the family and gives some teachings, the girl was listening to Arat Shariputra as well as she's getting some nectars there. Real blessings. Now reaching the age of like 14, 15, 16, she started to be distracted here and there. Then Arat Shariputra asked the, the father of the family, now go back to your backyard and get the bones out of that dog. Get the bones of the dog out of the ground. Then the father went and brought the, the bones and gave it to Arad Shariputra. Then Arad Shariputra put it on the table. Table and the, the girl was sitting next to Arad Shariputra. And Arad Shariputra just snapped. Bless the bone. What is that? The bone was the bone of the dog who took birth as the girl now. And instantly, because of the very strong karmic connection, the girl's karmic connection with Arath Shariputra, because of the blessings of 
Arya Shariputra and the girl's own very strong karmic connection with Arya Shariputra. Instantly, her the recollection of the past life instantly hit her mind. She instantly saw that she was the dog in a very immediate previous life. And then the very strong feeling of uncertainty of life, samsaric life. You as a dog, as a human being, as a human being, as an animal, as an animal, as a human being, as a human being, again, as a hungry ghost. As a, and then like this, total uncertain. We feel as so like, you know, we are like permanent. This is, you know, what I, the poor guy there, the poor animal there. We think like this, as well as we are so of the permanent guests in the world. But this girl realized way beyond our very narrow thinking. She could see the samsara from a very broad range in time and space. And then she just felt so repulsed to samsara and she became so dedicated to what Arath Shariputra had to teach. And then she attained nirvana within that very lifetime. Okay. So uh, the, what I'm saying here is the transmigration. It's not that there's a permanent self migrating from one place to another. While the self is impermanent, yet there's a the continuum there. That continuum, on the basis of this continuum, we explain the reincarnation. We do say that migration happens, transmigration happens, but the, what is rejected here is a permanent self transmigrating from one place to the next place. For example, the one example given is that, for example, every morning we use the mirror, mirror to look at your face, what your, your face is like. Your face does not really move there in the mirror. But something very similar to your face is reflected by dependence on many factors. Presence of your face here, the distance, the light, the mirror, all these factors, all these factors combined together give rise to the origination of the reflection of the, the face there. Your, mind, your face did not really jump there. But something of this face is is originated there, but depends on these factors. Okay, this is the another example given there. Okay, so the, what we'll do is that in this class, we'll try to read the text as much as possible. Then in the second class, uh, we will do the, uh, we'll keep a separate 10 minutes uh, for question and answers. Okay. It doesn't involve transmigration because the sprout and the seed are different. It's not that the sprout jumps to this, the, no, the seed jumps to, to, the, uh, to the next moment to become the sprout. No, it is, these two are very different. It means that the same is not in the second moment. That which the sprout is not a seed. How does it entail the formation of a large result from a small cause? A large fruit forms from planting a small seed. Therefore, it entails the formation of a large result from a small, a small cause. Lastly, fruit forms precisely according to the type of the seed planted. If you plant apple seed, don't expect mango trees growing. Don't expect mango fruits. Therefore, it involves continuity of similar time. Thus, is outer dependent arising to be seen in terms of five aspects. These are so precious. If you can think about these, then you're Say um, the end of the point that I'd like to share with you. These are so precious uh, sharing uh, that the otherwise we do encounter with these situations, but we never, if we take for granted, we never think about um, in these lines. The, um, the His Holiness, the Gandhi Tirumbachi, 103rd, 103rd His Holiness Gandhi Tirumbachi, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, the, um, when I was translating for him, there was many years ago when I was a student myself, and then um, the he was uh, they're discussing about uh, one of my classmates, and the um, and his own Gandhi Shri Mishra, 103, 103rd, and the said that this young monk, meaning that my classmate, the uh, he is he has a very strong, say the karmic. Uh, the uh, the imprints, uh, the, the imprints of dharma, coming imprints of dharma from the past lives, and I was just wondering, the, on what basis uh, this teacher is saying that? On what basis? How do we know that somebody has a very strong karmic connection with the dharma from the past life? I was so curious as a young boy, I must be in my my twenties. Then he said that, and the reason that he gave just intrigued me. 
said that whatever he said, this young monk, his student, this young my classmate, whatever he said is all it always tallies with, it always there's some barrenness. It always tallies with what you find mentioned in the authentic texts, authentic, authentic sutras and authentic Indian commentaries. What have he said? It's not that he read, he's so well read. No, he was just a young, young boy, young monk. And, you know, so during the debates, uh, when the question is randomly thrown to you, you have to give the answer. When you give the answer, given that the teacher is all so well read, so he could see what is said, tell us with what is said in this text, and would tell us with what is said in that text. So the teacher said that he has a very strong karmic connection with the Dharma from the past lives. I was so intrigued. Now, when I look at people, when I meet with many people, uh, some people who are never exposed to, to Dharma, when they, you know, when they're sharing their thoughts with me, I could relate them so well with, wow, that's amazing. So these are thoughts that came to me only through learning this text, that text, this text, that text, from this teacher, that teacher. But look at this boy, look at this girl. What she's saying, what he's saying is exactly the thoughts that came to me only after meeting with these teachings. Otherwise not. Wow, that's amazing. And whatever the person said, somehow connected with some very important points mentioned in the authentic sources. Okay, so these are the indication of the connection with the, the previous life uh, teachings. Okay, so with this, um, thus is outer dependent and arising is seen in terms of five aspects. Similarly, inner dependent and arising also arises from two principles. From what two principles? From causal relation and conditional relation. Causal meaning, say, what is the main cause? Say, inner meaning, your being, our being, the samsari beings like us. Inner dependent origination, the animate animate beings like us, how we come into existence by the 12 lengths of dependent origination. And the causal relation and the conditional relation. Causal relation means how we, say for example, the fact that we are, we are human beings now in samsara is because that we are, we are projected by previous karma. So that karma is the, the primary causal factor for our being projected as a human birth. And what projected, what created this karma? Because of the, say, the, the say ignorance, the first thing, ignorance. Ignorance. So this ignorance gives rise to the karma. Karma gives rise to consciousness. Consciousness gives rise to name and form and so forth. Uh, finally, to the becoming, the, the birth, aging, and death. So this is how uh, the inner dependent origination is causally related, causal relation. Conditional relation, conditional meaning that we, as for example, said today we are human beings and how we survive as human being, on what conditions, on the what factors as conditions, like the element of earth, water, fire, air, as explained in uh, the, the, the earlier with the outer dependent origination. So here I say the earth, water, fire, air, space, and instead of the time, it is the consciousness. So these, the six. Elements, elements are taught. Okay, let's read this. What then is a causal relation? Causal is a primary. Primary means related to the 12 links, not about the six elements. What then is a causal relation in inner dependent arising? It starts with ignorance. Ignorance, if possible, we, let's all try to remember these 12 links. Ignorance, ignorance, karma, consciousness, name and form, senses, contact, Feeling, craving, grasping, becoming, birth, aging, and death. So this, we, if possible, try to learn this by heart. These 12 links of dependent origination. So that when you have this by heart, then when these are explained, you don't really have to go to the, the drawing all the time. You don't go to the painting all the time. And if the painting is next to you, that's well and good. If not, and then those of you from the online, uh, the, if you have the book, you have the, if you have this book, hard copy, then you look at hard copy. It is there, the painting. Otherwise, we, here we cannot uh, the, share the two screens together. We can, but we don't know. Early said then I did it. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, so what we do is that those, those who have the hard copy with you, 
you turn to the uh, Wheel of Life painting, uh, which um, in my case, it is on page 308. Page 308, Wheel of Life painting. And if, the, if you don't have the hard copy, and if you don't know how to make the two screens on this, the two screen sharing on the same screen, um, then, <laughs> okay, so you have to listen to me, right? Okay, good. Okay, if you do have the hard copy is on page 308, um, varying depending on the different editions, it may differ one or two pages here, the in front or back. Okay, good, screen sharing. The text, the text. Okay. Um, then, uh, what then is the causal relation in inner dependent arising? It starts with ignorance, the first link at the top, at the outermost circle at the top with the, I say, the elderly man and the elderly man, the a blind person symbolic of ignorance. Okay, it starts from there clockwise. It starts with ignorance causing formation. Formation here refers to the karma. Why the karma refers to formation? In Tibetan it is duche. Because karma forms, karma decides the formation of your next birth. So therefore it is referred to formations. Ignorance causes, uh, causing formations, number two. So on until finally birth, which is 11, causes aging and death, aging and get death com combined together is number 12. If ignorance does not arise, then the formation does not manifest and so on until finally, if birth 11, 11 if the 11 stops, uh, they does not arise, then aging and death 12 do not manifest. Likewise from the existence. So this is the, uh, the causal dependent origination to two screens, okay. So our prime coordinator is trying her best to show us the two screens together on the screen, two, two sharing on the same screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our prime coordinator on her screen, the two, um, the two sharings are happening simultaneously, but it's not happening to us. Okay, now it's coming. Just see where I'm reading. You have to know where I'm reading. And then make sure that the other screen is overlapping that. No, other screen that only. La. Can I control the Mare? La. Okay, it's fine. Okay, those of you who can see the two screens together on the same screen when good if not it's that's easy okay so what we're reading is um the likewise from the existence of ignorance formation occurs and so on until finally from the existence of birth coming uh, comes aging and death ignorance doesn't think okay that is my show oh yeah ignorance doesn't think now similar to what we what we read before see the same Ignorance is a mental state within us. And it, it, it doesn't think that I'm going to create the formations. I'm not create, I'm going to create the karma. No. When, when the ignorance is there, then the ignorance, you know, say the different with the ignorance, then you feel attached, averse to the uh, three different feelings. And then automatically the uh, the um uh, the, the karma is created. So therefore, ignorance doesn't have the intention to give rise to the karma. Okay. Um, similarly, okay. Likewise, from the existence of this hustle, ignorance does not think. Page 68, ignorance does not think, I produce formation or karma, nor do formation think, we are produced by ignorance, and so on. Finally, birth, number 11, birth does not think, finally meaning, that all the other links are, are the say the, the subsumed under this of they're being abridged. Finally, bird does not think. I produce aging and death. And nor do aging and death think I am produced by birth. Nevertheless, formations take form and arise through the existence of ignorance and so on. 
until finally aging and death takes form and arise through the existence of birth. So this is purely dependent origination that the no one is actually thinking that I am creating the karma. The none of these 12 links as an individual, as a person. Yes, okay, I the so the, that happiness is a result of good karma. I will accumulate positive karma. Yes, as a person, you can think. But the ignorance that comes to your mind, that doesn't think that I'll create the karma. Okay, talk about this. Uh, this is thus is the causal relation in the inner dependent arising to be seen. How is the conditional relation? Conditional relation is very similar to what we did earlier, six elements. How is the conditional relation in inner dependent arising to be seen? So here, instead of the sprout, it is with the self, yourself, as a person which has six elements. This is very important. If you know these six elements so well, and how these six elements operate. What are the functions of each of the each of these six elements? If you know this, these are the best of descriptions because they are coming from the sutra. And uh, later on, when you meditate on emptiness on the basis of these six elements, as taught by the Arinigarjuna, then you can use these what is said in the, the sutras to make your understanding so crystal clear. And then according to your experience, emptiness will be very clear. Okay. Here. How is the conditional relation to uh, the Tashkilta? How is the conditional relation in inner dependent arising to be seen? As to the coming together of the six elements, as to the coming together of the which six elements, namely, the conditional relation of inner dependent arising is to be seen as due to the coming together of the elements of earth, water, fire, air, space, and consciousness. Okay. What is the earth element in inner dependent arising? So now explaining each of these elements this is, and the functions, this is so important. That which assembles to form the solidity of the body, that you have a body, solid body, that you are not like a liquid you know, flowing in the air. This solid body there, that solidity is given to you by the element of earth. That which assembles to form the, the solidity of the body is called the earth element. That which provides cohesion. How? that your, your body, the various parts of the body, they are put together. They're put together. For example, like the, uh, the, say the, the, the dust. When you put some water, then the dust will become clay. The dust will become clay. The cohesion coming together into one unit that is made by the water. Um, this is amazing. Uh, that which provides cohesion in the body is called water element. That which digests whatever the food, whatever body is, the food that we eat is digested, what we drink, what we chew, taste, um, this is called the element, fire element. That, that which functions, the, the, performs the function of the body's inhalation and exhalation is called the air element. That you breathe in, breathe out. That which allows the body to have Hollow spaces inside is called the space. Our body is made of 99.9% of the space. That, that which produces the sprouts of the... Okay, now look. Um, the, thus far is explaining the, uh, the, uh, the element of earth, water, fire, air, and space. So now is the consciousness. Element of consciousness. So um, that which produces a sprout of the name and form, like reeds in a sheaf. Sheaf meaning bundle of the stalks, bundle of the uh, the stalks or the bundle of the the branches, stalks put together. So when the two put together, like a body and the mind put together, so from there the consciousness is one of them. Name and form, name referring to the consciousness, form referring to body, and the like reeds in the sheaf. The reeds mean the individual the stalks in the collection bundle of the uh, these uh, the, the reeds. The combinations of five collections of consciousness, meaning that say consciousness and the body. Consciousness, they are the five sense consciousnesses and the one mental consciousness. Five collections of consciousness together with the defiled mental consciousness, six consciousness together, and is called the consciousness element, element of consciousness out of the six elements. Uh, without these conditions, the body cannot be born. So with this, the consciousness, the the element uh, the say the out of the six el elements this the, the consciousness and also the twelve links we have the number three which is consciousness. So number three giving rise to the name and form, name and form which is number four, 
without these conditions, the body cannot be formed. Say in the name and form, the form, which is the body, cannot be created if these earlier factors are missing, cannot be born. But when the inner earth element is not deficient, and likewise the element of water, fire, air, space, and consciousness are not deficient, then from the coming together of all these factors, the body forms. Okay, so we see that, for example, our body here, our body is the, our body does not really disintegrate. That's amazing. That's amazing. For example, when we die, after about three days, the body starts to stink. The body which we cherish so much, we take a shower every day. But when we die, the, till we die, the body, it has a natural order, which is not nice. But then when we die, the body stings. That, how it stings, how it stings when you're still alive, these are very different. Stinking because of the decomposition. When we are alive, the decomposition does not take place. So therefore, this is amazing. What keeps the body not to decompose because of the consciousness? So this consciousness sustains your body as a living body, the body of a human, body of the, the, the say, the sentient being. This is so important concept. Um, the, okay, how about this? Uh, in this process, earth element doesn't think the same thing. I provide the solidity of the body. Okay. How many agree with this? That the earth element doesn't think that I provide the solidity to the body, right? No, it doesn't think. And that the of the body by assembling. No, does the water element think I provide cohesion? No, the water is totally inanimate. It simply gives a cohesion, but it doesn't think that I'm giving the cohesion. Nor does the fire element think I digest whatever the body eats, drinks, chews, or tastes. Nor does the air element think I perform the function of the body's inhalation, exhalation. That's amazing how the body works. That's amazing. And nor does the space element think I create hollow spaces inside the body. Nor does the element of consciousness think I produce the name and form of the body. Nor does the body think I'm produced by these conditions. Yet when these conditions are present, the body is born. Okay. Uh, in this connection, I also like to share with you, blend with the modern education. Say Charles Darwin's evolution theory. Four billion, 4.7 billion years ago, 4.6 billion years ago, the planet Earth came out of the sun according to the physicist. Then it took, it took, it took like, say, 0 0.6 million, uh, the 0 0.6 billion years, 0 0.6 billion years for the water to be formed on the planet Earth. 0 0.6 billion. The water is formed, then unicellular, the first unicellular organism came into existence in the water. That is 4.6 billion years ago. 4.6 billion years, okay, 4 billion years ago. 4.6 billion years ago, the planet Earth was formed. 4 billion years ago, the, the water was formed on the planet Earth. It took like 0.6 billion years, billion years. And 4 billion years ago, with the water, then the unis, first unicellular organism came into existence. So now look, this unicellular organism is not, is so simple, one single cell, that's it. It's an organism, but with a single cell. But how many cells that we have? We have trillions of cells with us. Not really. Yeah, I think more than trillion. I think it's about like, uh, if you are like 70 kg, it said that you have 70 into 10 to the raise of 27. I say the 27, the, uh, the say the uh, cells. This is what you're made of. So, now today it's become very complex, very sophisticated. But four billion years ago, it was just a unicellular, our ancestor, first ancestor was just a single cell organism. Now we become very sophisticated. According to physics, the law of entropy, entropy law, it says that the disorderliness, disorderliness will keep increasing. But in the case of the organisms, orderliness kept increasing over the last four, ye four, four billion years. That's amazing. So now, look at how our body works. It's amazing. When, the, when we say, when you are in a very say, hot place, the body perspires. Why? 
to keep the body cool because the body is to remain maintain a, the a proper uh, the uh, temperature if it exceeds that temperature for example like say if it exceeds like uh, the same the hunt the same 96 96 fahrenheit 96 9800 then your body cannot take it we say that you have a fever if the body the the if you the body temperature drops again you will you will die it goes it shoots high too high again you die so body maintain a particular temperature so what is that mechanism to maintain this the perspiration when you are so hot when you're in a hot place your body perspires to take the heat out this amazing process so this must be missing in the unicellular organism our first ancestor so how come that it developed to such a sophistication today what is that agent so yes there is charles Darwin who call it as the evolution what is evolution depending on the origination but depending on these factors then things become more and more sophisticated more and more sophisticated, more and more sophisticated and out of these factors there's one factor which is most important which charles Darwin could not did not really explain and could not really explain did not come to his mind is the karma because of this missing this missing link uh, the, the charles Darwin's evolutionary theory it faces lots of explanatory gaps okay so this is where one of the greatest elements depend upon which all the sophistication is happening charles Darwin would say randomness why the unicellular organism becomes more and more sophisticated uh, while physics talks about entropy the disorderliness increases rather than orderliness increasing but charles Darwin said the opposite and how is this happening why not disorderliness the answer is, is random it's just random there's no explanation so when you say random it's too simplistic answer so why not randomly the human being today becomes a demon tomorrow or the a dog uh, to, uh, yesterday can become a human being today why not so randomness doesn't have a room so all this explanatory gap happens because that they fail to identify all the major factors one of which is the law of the, the karma okay the earth element is not a self now look so there people believe in the in the, the early traditions same when you see, they see these phenomena of the earthquake volcano then the thunderstorm and so forth oh now the god is angry send the thunderstorm okay um the so that's amazing in fact somebody sent me a, a cd uh see what a message saying that whenever there was a thunderstorm and the what is it lightning a small child was so happy and the mother asks why are you so happy when there's a lightning and the small child says that the god is taking picture of me clicking me with the photograph right so that's beautiful so look these are the concepts so when there's some um, lightning you feel that there's somebody who's doing that and then who's that i this body is not me but there's some i there some solid i independent i so these are the two major things that create a agent as an external creator and this i which is so permanent so these are two major things which revolve around around many of the philosophical traditions yes this i is very important and we we actually all of us if not 100 percent, 99 percent of what we do uh, we make the living is just for this i to sustain this i why this i is so important and when something goes wrong to this eye, you start panicking, which means that this eye is so important. Yes, it's so important. Let's not forget it. But it also means that there's some so solid entity inside there. And neuroscientists, some of the neuroscientists, radical neuroscientists, will say that uh, what the Buddhism said is very true. When we go into the neurons, there's no eye there, selflessness. But the Buddhism doesn't reject the self. Self does exist in the bit. It cannot be found in the ultimate through ultimate analysis like looking at the uh, through the reductionist approach you cannot see the, the self there but it does exist in the form of a subjective imputation okay so so what is being said here is about this okay it's already 3 30. okay we'll stop here 
Deyatavum gati gati para gati para sam gati bodhiswahatyata om gati gati para gati Para samgate bodhisvatyata om gate gate para gate para samgate bodhisvatyata